Hi, my name is Jing. I am the Operational Associate for CCPS. I am here at the 8th Global Congress with Dr. TJ. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. TJ. Hi, how are you? Hi, we just had a wonderful um, luncheon with your speech. Could you share a little about your speech with the connected viewers? Sure. Um, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, my presentation today was about how to reduce accidents. And my area of specialty is communication. I'm not a chemical engineer, and I'm not really even a safety guy. I've learned some safety, but almost everyone in that audience would know more safety than me. My area is communication, and specifically I work on how do words change behavior. And the point I was trying to make today is that you have, it, it, there's two steps in changing behavior. The first one is awareness. People have to be aware that something is happening, that there's a new policy or a new procedure. But it doesn't mean that they change. They don't change until there's a personal, face-to-face -face conversation with someone that they know or respect. And in, in the process plant world, that often means the supervisor. So my point today was you can produce all the safety communication you want, all the safety banners and posters and slogans and videos and every training programs but at the end of the day the supervisor has to walk up to his or her employee and they have to say here's the new procedure on confined space and by the way I want you to do this this is important to me and I want you to do this and without that personal commitment at that level you don't get the behavior change you just get tons of communication but you don't actually get the behavior change so that's what I was talking about also from the speech that I heard that you show us a picture of how the CEO was trying to relay a message to the workers. How come the CEO does not have the same effect as the supervisor? <laughs> oh, good question, Jay. That's excellent. Uh, yeah, I showed you a picture of the CEO and he's talking safety to a bunch of uh, frontline employees. Right. And, you know, it's a nice thing for him to do that and it's useful, but it doesn't change behavior. He, sources that are very different from the receivers, sources that are far away from the receivers, have very little impact on behavior. So even if the President of the United States comes to speak to you, Barack Obama comes to speak to you, we don't really expect him to change your behavior. You may enjoy the conversation, you may find it flattering, you may find it interesting, but it's not likely to lead to behavior change. If I know people who you really respect, it might be your parents, it might be a professor, it might be a close friend, and I get them to talk to you, I have a much greater chance of changing your behavior. So my point in that picture was, it's nice that the CEO goes around talking to people, but you shouldn't expect a reduction in accidents, you shouldn't really expect behavior change. Now, if you can get the frontline supervisors to be committed to those changes, then you should expect very large changes in behavior, because we know that changes behavior. Also, um, how do you think that in the industry, how does communication improve process safety or relate the uh, process to safety better? Well, you know, today, um, you know, with permission, I'm very critical of the process safety information that we give to supervisors. Uh, in my presentation, I talked about the average reading level of uh, policies and procedures. I mean, things like confined space, log out and tag out, management of change, um, overhead crane operation, handling hazardous material, all of these kind of standards and procedures. On average, they're written at about grade level 14. That means you takes uh, all of high school and two years of college to be able to read it. Only 17% of the American public reads at grade level 14. So we're looking at 83% of people who really have no chance of understanding that material. And that's, you know, that's a big number. And that's our fault. So often uh, companies say to me, well, we need to improve the education skills of our supervisors. I think, well, you know, that's a big job and a long time and very expensive. I got a better idea. Why don't we make the communication easier to read and leave the supervisors alone? And uh, I can take some of that exact same information and rewrite it at grade level seven or eight, which 50% of people can read, and I don't lose any content. It's just, it's just careful writing. It's using very small words and very short sentences and making things very clear and really struggling with getting it down to the bare minimum. 
and you can take a lot of this complicated information we do and you can reproduce it to make it much more accessible. Okay. And also for supervisors, how do they like successfully communicate with the workers in order to um, I'll say prosecute it what was important better? How do they communicate better with the workers? You know, my view on this, Jane, is that the view that I take is that supervisors are in fact expert communicators. A lot of people in my business think, well, we need supervisor training to get them to improve their communication. My view is the opposite, that the supervisors are excellent communicators to frontline employees. They might not be the best communicators upward to engineers or process plant people, but they're excellent communicators in general to frontline employees. So that, for example, 70% uh, in America, 70% of frontline employees will say they have a good communication relationship with their supervisor. That's a very high number. And if they're saying they have good communication, well then they do because they're the receivers, so that's important. So my view is that supervisors know how to communicate. And if you ask them, if you go to supervisors and say, well, how do you want to communicate this new standard or this new procedure? They'll almost always tell you the same thing. They want to do it face to face. They want to do it casually. They want to do it one-on-one -on -one or in very small groups. They're not comfortable standing up in a formal setting. They're not really comfortable running a meeting. So my advice is, well, let's move the communication so it meets the needs of the supervisors. If they like casual face-to-face one-on-one communication, let's assume they know what they're talking about, and let's give them communication that lends itself to doing that. That will usually mean a diagram, a picture, lots of white space, small call-outs which, which highlight technical details so that the supervisor can put it down on a table, a lunch table or a break table or something, and he or she can say, oh, Jane, come on over here a second. I want to show you this. This is the new procedure for confined space. And they can, they can talk about it. It's not text to be read. It's a picture to be looked at and discussed between us. Okay. So my communication really tends to lend itself to face-to-face, -face, casual, small group, one-on-one -on -one communication, because that's the way the supervisors tell me they want. Okay, so does that mean that verbal communication is better than written communication in a way? Yes, it does. Okay. Well, I have to have to be a little bit more precise with that. Face-to-face um, -face verbal communication will, in general, lead to 13 times more behavior change than a written document. So it's not like twice as good, it's not right. five times as good, it's like 13 times as good at changing behavior. Now, if your goal is comprehension, if you're studying something really complicated, and I know you're a chemical engineer, and if you're studying something really complicated, you really need that written, because there the goal is comprehension. But my goal is behavior change. See, I'm talking about something a little different. I want you to behave differently. We know the key to behavior change is face-to-face -face communication. Thank you. Thank you for coming with us for the interview and we hope to see you at our next conference. I would love to be there.